Today, we have the future of internet privacy. And we have a lovely panel in front of us. And we're going to welcome our diverse and esteemed panel with moderator Brian. Thank you. Very, thank you. Thank you very much. So to introduce myself, and I'll let, uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves as well. Uh, my name is Brian Sovereign. I'm the host of a podcast known as Sovereign Tech. It is a tech podcast, science and tech podcast, that has a, it's very liberty oriented. It's pretty rare. Uh, I don't know too many others quite like it. Uh, so you can go to SovereignTech.com to check that out. But uh, I've also, uh, I have been in the cypherpunk community pretty much since I was a teenager, so since the 90s. I've uh, been very much involved in this sort of thing. I had a brief, st unfortunate stint in the U.S. military where I also dealt with uh, cybersecurity issues. Uh, and I have worked for a multitude of tech companies in this field. So it's a very serious subject to bring up the, the future of internet privacy. Uh, of course, it's questionable whether it even had a past, uh, but maybe we'll get into some of that. Uh, but in any case, thank you so much for being here, and uh, I will let the uh, the panelists start introducing themselves. We actually have a great group that represent uh, a lot of very interesting projects uh, that are going on right now. So, uh, Paige, if you want to start. Hi, um, I'm Paige Peterson. I do communications work for a company called MadeSafe, which I presented yesterday morning. Um, and I guess there'll be a video or audio up for that eventually. Um, I have been kind of involved in this community for about three years. I've been to Portfest three times. Um, I'm interested in like decentralized technology, so I talk a lot about, uh, I have talked a lot about like mesh networking and things like that at Porkfest. And yeah, I'm interested in uh, user privacy and internet security in general. Jeremy? Hi, I'm Jeremy Kaufman. I'm a serial entrepreneur and computer scientist. Uh, my most relevant work to the people here would probably be my work on Library, which is a decentralized content publishing platform. Uh, I'm also a Free State Project member and early mover, and I've been living in New Hampshire for about six months now. Allison? Hi, I'm Allison Macrina. I'm director of the Library Freedom Project, which is an initiative that brings anti-surveillance technologies into local communities via libraries. And I also work very closely with Tor Project, which is um, one um, technology project that helps people have anonymity online. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, fantastic. So great group of people. Absolutely, they're worth a round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, why don't we get right into the questions, and we are going to make time, try to make time anyway, for uh, questions from the audience. I'm sure, I mean, this is such a hot topic. I can imagine a lot of people have a lot of questions on this matter. Uh, but let's start it off, and everyone is welcome to answer this. Of course, if you don't feel you, ha you have an answer that you want to spread, I don't know why you're on this panel. Uh, in fact, you could leave the room now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, okay. but I think it's pretty clear that at the onset of the Internet, which the Internet, of course, we could get into terms of, you know, the World Wide Web is separate from the Internet, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to get into, you know, into that level necessarily. Um, but at the onset of the Internet, which has been around for some time, uh, there's certainly a lot of, there, there was kind of a set manners, like, uh, like good manners that, that, that were laid out by the initial users. And, of course, a lot of them were very much college kids, uh, and, or not college kids, but uh, uh, college attendees uh, and the like. Um, and proponents, I, I think at the time, especially going into the 90s, uh, they were trying to instill a, a culture on the internet. In fact, a, a the word, I probably never saw the word anarchic or anarchist get used more than in the 90s tech news, uh, because that was the way that people described the internet. It was, it was kind of part and parcel with it. Uh, and, you know, a lot of things, things like advertising were considered uh, anathema. I mean, like, that, that was not okay. It wasn't until Yahoo came around that that even was figured out how to do it. Uh, and, of course, guys uh, uh, like Dave, well, now the name's escaping me, but even, like, email advertising, all that were, were later developments in the history of the Internet. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that while the early Internet culture certainly valued things like privacy and anonymity, it's not something that was baked into the infrastructure or the technology at all. Uh, of the internet itself. Even one of, the, one of the pioneering engineers of the internet, that being Vint Cerf, who works for Google right now, uh, he said, if I could start over again, I would have introduced a lot more strong authentication and cryptography into the system. So obviously, 
privacy and anonymity wasn't necessarily part of the program. It wasn't baked into the technology from the get-go. Um, but the internet is still, even with that not being a part of it, has still changed, I think most people would, uh, would agree that it has changed the very foundations of society, how things work. Uh, so what do you see, panelists, as the kind of the importance of having things like privacy and anonymity uh, on the like of the internet? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, so I guess um, it's pretty simple to see that a lot of our general um, communications and everyday life is being put on the internet. So it's really just mapping the privacy that we expect in our daily lives in person, like closing your curtains at night when it's easier to see in and just you know mapping that on to how we interact with the internet since um, you know, general communications are happening more and more that way. And then, you know, um, similarly, but, um, you know, from a different perspective, it's just that there's a lot of uh, organization and activism that happens on the internet, um, uh, you know, in this community and other communities where, uh, you know, since a lot of the internet is run by large corporations, there's threats to censorship of, um, you know, radical ideas, which are important for society in general to progress. So just in general daily life stuff, and then, you know, being able to push new ideas and push radicalism. So is it kind of like, are you sort of saying that, that a lot of things that people didn't expect the internet to be used for require privacy and anonymity? I mean, it's th things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, if you want to go ahead. Uh, sure. So my, my first response to what Brian said would be, uh, you know, when you grow from a culture that was originally a small group of, let's call them uh, more introverted, thoughtful nerds, and grow to a population of, sure. of billions of people. It's not, it's not that surprising to me that the culture changes. Um, I think that privacy is absolutely vital. If you don't have the ability to communicate privately, you're, that's almost certainly a sign that you're in some kind of uh, totalitarian regime. Um, so privacy is a hard requirement, right? If you don't have the ability to communicate privately, that's a huge problem in whatever society that you're in. Uh, at the same time, I think it still is very possible to be private on the internet when you want to be. And I also think there are lots of times where it's actually quite rational uh, to surrender your privacy, but we can probably get into that into some later answers. Yeah, I think we'll get into that a little bit later. Allison, your thoughts? Um, totally agree with everything that my fellow panelists have said. And just to add to that, basically, not just that the internet is this massive communication tool and tool for research and ideas and, and organizing and all this, it is real life, right? I mean, it's not, there is no distinction anymore between physical space and internet space. We do everything online. And so in the, as, as the internet has increased in scale, the capabilities for mass surveillance have increased. So we're talking about a world in which um, the competing interests of the internet, that is corporations, intelligence agencies and law enforcement, and then regular people, um, the capabilities for those first two very powerful bodies are so great, they've never had that, um, the, the ability to interfere in our, our regular lives before. So the other thing is like what Brian said, the internet was never designed with privacy or security in mind. I think the people who originally created the internet didn't think of it as something that would scale in the way that it did. So what you have now is something that people use for every part of their lives that is not private or secure by design. And the other thing is that most people don't really know much about using their computers at all. I don't think they realize the depth to which their privacy is being compromised in all the in invisible ways. So I think you know we have this sort of perfect storm of like, you know, major ways that our privacy is being violated and also the most important tool that we've ever seen in human existence um, that needs to be protected if we want to actually have freedom, so. Yeah, absolutely. And it is important to keep that in mind that it is the most important, like, or most powerful perhaps even tool uh, that humanity has ever devised and is certainly widespread using. Uh, that, that's, that's important to keep in mind here. Uh, so, you know, each of you is, uh, part of a different project here, of course, Pages with Made Safe, uh, 
Jeremy's with library. Do you, do you library or LBRY? Which way do you call that? I, I like to say library, if, especially if I'm on the radio. I do like to make sure that I spell it out so people can find it on the internet. I love it. LBRY.io, of course. Uh, and then Allison, of course, you're with the Library Freedom Project. And you can speak for Tor to some degree here yeah, as well. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, a, we're a decentralized community. That's how it works, right? Not That's how everything should work. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so you're all part of a very different, you know, very important project. I think maybe there's different goals here, uh, and it's wonderful to kind of have that representation here. And I, you know, I certainly see a lot of value in each, uh, and I'm definitely a fan of of each project here that that's that's uh, being represented. So, and I'm curious what each one of these made safe, LBRY, Tor, uh, and Library Freedom Project. Perhaps Tor might be kind of obvious for some here. Does everybody here know what Tor is? Cool. Fair that's enough. Right. Okay, that's a good that's a good awesome. amount of people, um, but how do, how does your project contribute uh, to internet privacy and the future of the internet in general? Really, I think would be uh, good to know. Paige, you can start off. So I guess the fundamental um, issue that Made Safe is trying to solve is the insecurities that servers introduce in the current internet and um, how we've become dependent on these what's which were once uh, a decentralized network of servers, but the incentive to centralize these uh, into, you know, incentives controlled by corporations mostly to centralize e these into database centers and whatnot, you know, controlling a lot of the storage and computation that we expect um, to, to happen for us. And there's also a strong, so there's that essential you know, piece of removing the server and turning it into a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is run by individuals and incentivized uh, so that the individuals will maintain their nodes in this network. And then additionally, to include that inherent privacy and security properties that the internet didn't have. So inherent encryption of all communications between peers and all, you know, data being uploaded to the network, being inherent, like encrypted automatically um, so it's really just taking a step back and, um, you know, looking at how the internet is. It's, it's different in a, a lot of ways because we're trying to solve, like, be this one package type thing, whereas there tends to be a lot of the solutions that we have today are just, you know, picking uh, one thing that needs to be solved. So MadeSafe is really trying to eliminate the need for a server, right, for the big iron? Yeah, yeah for servers. And... In so doing, you're creating an alternate infrastructure that, that really will have, unlike Vint Cerf, who failed at baking in privacy and cryptography, you will bake in privacy and cryptography. That, that's the in basic addition, gist. Yeah. In addition, yeah. So th I, I think that's incredibly important for a lot of reasons. Uh, he also, Vint Cerf also met with the founder of MadeSafe several years ago, David Irvine, and I think he liked what he heard, but we'll see. I hope so, because Vint Cerf's also on the record for saying he thinks privacy may be an anomaly uh, like that. It's not something that's inherent to the human condition. I, of course, would disagree, but uh, that maybe is more of a philosophical question. Jeremy, how is LBRY.io contributing to the future of the internet yeah. and internet privacy? Absolutely. So library is a, a decentralized content publishing platform. What that means is anyone can publish to it, uh, and that includes anonymously if you want to publish anonymously. And it's very difficult to censor once content has been pushed to the network. Um, so certainly in terms of uh, supporting the ability for private speech and private release of media, library absolutely facilitates that. Uh, we also think library is going to have a big impact on the internet in general. We, you know, we think it is a more efficient protocol uh, in terms of distributing data and things like that. So library is absolutely trying to change the, the way that the internet works. Uh, and I see it as part of, uh, along with MadeSafe and all of these other projects and the, you know, these decentralized applications, what happens is, is uh, you know, there's a sort of artificial inefficiency that's being enforced, and then smart technologists and entrepreneurs route around that inefficiency, right? Uh, and that's exactly what Bitcoin is doing. Um, that's exactly what all of these projects are doing, is that there's a lot, there, there is an artificial inefficiency that's been created, and then there are smart people who route around that. If you could actually real quick describe like that, that artificial efficiency a little bit, or efficiency, right? In, in, yeah, and efficiency, right? So, uh, well, okay, um, the, you know, a big appeal of Bitcoin is that I don't have to use 
major banks, right? And so the government has a bunch of rules for major banks. You can't start your own currency. Right. There's, there's not a competition in currencies or banking. Right. That's an artificial inefficiency, right? right? And so, uh, how, but if you wanted to enforce banking laws against Bitcoin, you can't do it. That's part sure. of what you right. So I can't. There, I if you know who does the when I deal with this all the time in another business. Know right. your know your customer laws in banking. They're absolutely atrocious. It is a nightmare dealing with funds. Okay, well, how how would you know your customer laws apply to Bitcoin? Who 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 is required to you know record? So so it's a technical way of saying we're getting rid of the middlemen. It's it's a it's a yes it's a technical way of routing around uh, you know it's okay we have this roadblock well how can we get around that roadblock as cheaply or, you know as possible sure yeah. absolutely so uh, Allison now I mean Library Freedom Project incredibly exciting and of course you can talk on Thank tour you. as well uh, I mean seriously <laughs> <laughs> so you know how, what what are you doing what is your project doing uh, you know for internet privacy and maybe the internet in general into the future. Totally. So first, I just want to say, as far as that person who said that privacy is a hum an anomaly of the human condition, I think those arguments are so full of shit. I challenge <laughs> that person to walk outside naked. Like, truly. <laughs> just go. I mean, he's wearing clothes, right? right. He, he's not going to give me his credit card number. He's not going to give me his text messages. Like, I hate that. Exactly. Attitude. Anyway, so Library Freedom Project, basically, what, what we do at Library Freedom Project is built from the, the belief that surveillance affects everybody's life. You know, everyone cares about privacy, everybody has a right to it, and that our present state with, um, that we are, are governed by a bunch of bad laws and old laws that make surveillance really possible. I mean, think for a second just about the Apple case that's going on right now. Um, the reason any of that is, is, is possible is because of a law that is actually from the 18th century. I mean, it's, it's totally ridiculous that, that our policy hasn't kept up at all with um, technological advancements. And while I believe and support the work of organizations that are trying to make changes to that, like EFF and ACLU, the fact is it takes forever to change laws and we are affected by surveillance every day right now. So what Library Freedom Project does is we try to bring anti-surveillance technologies to real people, help make them more usable, more mainstream and ubiquitous because I think that we all have a responsibility to protect ourselves today. So that's what Library Freedom Project is doing. Um, Tor Project is a really amazing initiative of um, people who are trying to bring anonymity uh, anti-surveillance technologies and anti-censorship tools um, to the public. So uh, Tor Browser recognizes the various ways that browsers are insecure and you can be tracked based on your browsing activity. Um, uh, Tor Messenger is a new way to communicate via Jabber and OTR more securely. Tor Hidden Services are websites that are censorship resistant and also help pre prevent some surveillance. So. Tor has a number of different projects going on. I would say the fundamental things to Tor Project are decentralization, free software, and an open network. So the same sort of values that inform these two projects, Tor Project is very much um, participating in that kind of world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more the merrier. Uh, totally. Anybody doing, you know, Tor Project made safe, lbry.io, bring on all the projects. Uh, there's we solve the, different problems, right? Right, yeah, solve different problems, address uh, different communities, whatever the case may be. There, there's no reason uh, not to have as many as possible. And you know, you, you brought up a great point, Allison. I think that surveillance does affect people in ways they don't even know. Uh, it's a psychological thing. When you know you're being watched, there is just a difference in how you act. And I mean, you, and if there's total surveillance, you know, everything we do is, is ended up, you know, getting put on this little device here, often enough pictures, whatever else. Uh, and I think that w when, you th when you start to get it in your head, well, someone can always be watching, you're never going to truly be yourself. You know, you're never going to express yourself completely with these wonderful tools that allow us to be as creative as, as we could possibly ever be. Uh, so th it's a really great point to bring up that surveillance is, it, it, it's, a you know, it's a philosophical question as much as it is a technical one because it really brings down you know, onto people things that just, they, they, don't, they don't realize. Yeah, I mean, I don't think most people realize just how much it affects your life. Um, so why don't we go on to, uh, to the next question here. And I guess, you know, with all that said, does anybody here, and this is where things might get a little heated, does anybody see <laughs> any, <laughs> I hope, start throwing tomatoes, somebody, come on. <laughs> uh, do you see any upsides, perhaps, 
to not having privacy, to surrendering, actually Jeremy said it earlier, to surrendering privacy. Uh, when you consider perhaps like some of the features and services that Google or Facebook offers, I mean these things are effectively free. How many people have a Facebook account? You all failed at privacy. Leave the room. No. <laughs> I, I, so I think it's quite rational for me to have a, a Facebook account. Yeah. Well, so, actually, it's not just rational. Uh, you would, I, I forget what report it was. Uh, I, I think psychologists would say that you're insane if you don't have one, like they, they, or that you're a terrorist. There's a lot of, a lot of crazy claims that go with that. Um, but I mean, they're not exactly free. These services do come at the cost of your data of your personal data, which, like Allison said earlier, it's data that is, uh, you know, it's just as relevant in meat space as it is in the digital space. Um, so is there a time when it's ever worth it to surrender your privacy? Yeah. Go ahead, Jeremy. So, yeah, my answer would be there's tons. And I'm, I'm, happy, tons. I'm happy to play the heel here for this conversation. Right, know, so like we this. can we can get some, yeah, so perhaps I'll make the especially contrarian arguments. That, that <laughs> privacy is important. If you have a society in which you can't be private, that's a huge deal, okay? So you need, to, I mean, so don't take any of this answer to mean that you, that that's not really important because it's, it's, it absolutely is. But there's tons of times where it's smart for me to surrender my privacy, okay? Like transparency is really what trust is all about, right? If, if I'm driving on a road, I would far prefer to be driving on a road where I know that every other car can be clearly identified. If I get in an accident, I'm gonna know who hit me. I would not wanna drive down a road where Every car is anonymous, and it would be very easy for, for cars to uh, you know, hit me and get away. Uh, and the same applies for all kinds of things. If, if you're, especially if I'm entering new relationships, so I enter into new business relationships and things like that all the time. Transparency is how I can trust you. If all I have is a, a pseudonym, I don't know anything about you, I don't, you know, it, so I, I think it's, it's very rational to surrender it uh, for lots of times for trust building purposes and that kind of thing. Um, Okay. Sure. Uh, Allison or Paige, whoever, who's got a comment here? I can go ahead. Um, so generally speaking, I'm interested in privacy because I'm interested in people having control over their lives. I think that if you choose to surrender your privacy, that's your business and you should be able to do that. But what bothers me about the current state of, of, te of technical surveillance is that we've not made that choice. It's been made on our behalfs. So I think if we start to think about privacy as a form of control over our personal selves, then sure, if you choose to have a Facebook, I'm gonna disagree with you about the necessity of it, um, <laughs> but I think what I want I want people to know what is actually at stake and what they're actually giving up and how invisible tracking works and how Facebook and entities like that work with um, sovereign states and law enforcement to exploit you. So I think once people know sort of all the contours of it, if they want to choose to, to give it up anyway, like I'm not trying to get in the way of anybody's freedom. The other side of it is that I believe in absolute full transparency for governments and corporations. Um, I think that there is, if there is any kind of tension, I think it's a matter of personal freedom versus um, powerful entities, right? So I think that governments should not have any privacy at all. Um, but hu regular humans should absolutely have a right to privacy. Paige, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I definitely agree that um, in terms of matters relating to larger communities and you know a larger corporation or um, organization, then um, if they're if they're serving a community and uh, people are dependent on them, they should be transparent. And the people that are depending on them should push them to be transparent. It should be um, a, a very natural thing. They should like have the incentive to be transparent rather than you know the opposite, which is a lot of what happens today. And I think in terms of uh, individual privacy, yes, the option should always be there to do whatever you want. I think there's m more interesting discussions around perhaps like the idea of segmenting your identity so that you're not necessarily giving up the entirety of uh, your personal information when you're opting into say like a, uh, being able to identify your car or something like that. But, so can I ask, since it, I think I'm the only person up on this side that has a Facebook account and is not, or at least is not embarrassed about having one. Um, and yeah, I am I, embarrassed. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed. I thought that you had one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, w I assume when I use Facebook that they have down to the millisecond data of everything that I'm doing. Uh, wh where I am on the page, essentially where my eyes are, what I'm looking at, what I'm liking, all of these things. 
why why do I care if that's public information? Like I actually have my Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, I know it's completely open. I have no restrictions on my Facebook page. It's not restricted to my friends. I have my privacy settings on Facebook dialed to maximally visible because anything I post on Facebook, I'm I consider to be public information. All what? right. So, but to Paige's point, Nelson, I want to hear. I want to sure. hear you. Um, to, I mean, to Paige's point is that th why why does it have to be this broad swath? Why do we have to collect the dolphins with the tuna? Like that's that's kind of what's happening here. Okay. Well, I mean, I certainly get concerned when the government's doing it. I certainly get concerned when it's hidden asymmetries of information are mm -hmm. an especially big deal when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't, does someone want to like why why do I want to hide what my likes and interests are from the world? Well, it must be nice for you that you get to think that seriously because many people their threat model is so much different I think for example of somebody like uh, a young man named Jelani Henry who lives in Harlem who is a teenager uh, he was put in Rikers for two years because of his Facebook likes um, because the law enforcement the New York Police Department believed that the, the likes that he was posting on Facebook were um, statuses of known gang members. So then he was put in Rikers, he was detained without trial for two years, and they did to him what they do to everybody in Rikers where they offered him a plea and said, you know, we have all this evidence against you, you should just take the plea, otherwise you're gonna go to prison for like 10 years. He refused the plea, it's a remarkable thing that he did this, and he was released finally after two years, but my point is that there are many people for whom the, it's not just a matter of like, oh, what do I have to hide? Who cares? What could possibly happen to me? Um, many people, this is not, it's not simply the case. The other thing too is that I, I really reject this idea that people know exactly what kind of tracking is happening of them on Facebook. So for example, do you guys know that like Facebook direct messages are analyzed against something called the DHS stop word list. So Department of Homeland Security has a list of words. I think it's something like 200 or 300 words long. And in this list, they have things like bomb and uranium and jihad and whatever the hell else. You know, the sort of like national security and then protect the children lists. So there is analysis of your direct messages between you and your contacts on Facebook to see if you are, are triggering this word list. And then because Facebook is a totally opaque company, we don't actually know what's ha what happens from there, how they might use this. We know they have the capabilities to do it and we know that this is something that they do. So does that mean that like, you know, the people who might be tr you know, uh, identified on this trigger word list have nothing to worry about? Because I don't think so. Yeah, I think Jeremy would agree that, or, well, I'll let Jeremy. Yeah, I can't, I mean, I, you're right, I'm not going to, I can't, I obviously can't defend either of those. I mean, yeah. right, co cops are going <laughs> to cop, right? Like, I don't, I don't think the solution to cops being abusive with their powers is like, oh, well, let's not give them our Facebook likes. Like, that's not, you know, that, that, that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just I think that's probably, and I'm not doubting the case. I just think that's almost certainly like an extraordinary situation. Now, the stuff with the the government. I mean, how many cases do you have where someone went to jail because of their Facebook likes? I mean, I is there actually? I think it's enough that somebody did. Well, all right, I would have to further understand the details of that case. I mean, I guess I'm 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 slightly skeptical of it, having just heard about it. And even if it not even taking it completely at face value, I don't I don't think that that's like an actual pattern of behavior that could have happened. If they're gonna arrest him for that, they could arrest him for wearing a t-shirt or arrest him for any kinds of other Well, let me, uh, other let me ask this question, let me ask this question because I think all of this can be solved as long as Facebook is optional, right? As long as it's an option. Like, yeah. I mean, then, then maybe some of this can't, can't happen. But what if, you know, Facebook doesn't become an, like, what if it's no longer optional? Like, I mean, do, does anybody here see the potential that Facebook could become as required as a driver's license? Well, I mean, they're already trying to do that with internet.org, uh, you know, spreading the internet to the entire world, but the internet actually the really internet, means right. Facebook. <laughs> so uh, I, I see it as a very real possibility for those, uh, those communities. Um, I see the, the social pressure of, face, of having a Facebook more, um, more strenuous on, on you know, individuals like me who don't have Facebook rather than like, you know, s a company requiring me to use a Facebook Connect to log in. I rarely run into that. And even if I do, I'm just like, oh, screw that. Then I won't use their services. But uh, yeah, I see the, the social pressures of having a Facebook as more problematic and um, would uh, definitely just question their, their whole internet.org initiative.
I just have something to add about the, the making it we'll mandatory. We'll let Jeremy talk more too. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Jeremy. Um, so to exactly Paige's point about about Facebook's so-called free basics and the social pressure of using it, you know, the internet is technically optional, right? I mean, no sure. one's coercing you into using it, but like you can't really have a life without it. The other thing is that we've already seen that these private companies, private tech companies like Google are already becoming mandatory. If you have a child in high school, in the, if a high school uses Google apps for education, you better fucking believe that your kid has to have a Google account. Um, Boston, where I live, the entire city has moved their IT infrastructure to Google apps. So that means that every city, organ every city entity is run their their IT is is run by Google. Now tell me how you know optional that becomes when the right. basic services that we rely on from our local governments, from our schools are now entirely moving to this private company's infrastructure. So is Facebook next? I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily likely, but I think that we've already seen it happen. Yeah, and you have to have a Google account because of the prevalence of Chromebooks. They've raised 40% in the past year being used in education as well as in government, uh, uh, you know, various municipalities. Uh, so that, 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 that's a fair point. Uh, Jeremy, what would yeah, you guys I mean, my, my, my problems are just almost always going to be with government. I mean, I see almost all of these services as voluntary services uh, that you choose to use. Uh, you know, you don't get to pick your government. There's no ability to start new governments. That's where the problem lies. That's the root issue of all of these things. Right? So the, the solution to your towns, you know, relying on Google is that we need to have an ability that people can create new towns that don't rely on Google. It's not that we shouldn't use Google. And I feel like if we're getting upset at at Google and Facebook, we're getting upset at, at people who are actually quite frequently stuck in the middle. Like, I, I bet Facebook, all things the same, would prefer to not have to hand over their data. They may choose to hand over their data, but the government is also going to put a lot of pressure on them, legal and extra legal, to get what they want. I mean, we've seen people like, uh, who was the Quest CEO, who went to jail for trying to deny uh, the government's request, there right? Been so. Yeah, yeah there have been some companies that have shut down instead of complying with, yeah. with the government. I mean, I'm not... I, I'm not convinced that I think these companies are, are quote willing friends of the government because the government is offering them certain things. But the real root of the problem is that the government is in position to be negotiating in these ways. Not I don't know. I don't I don't place nearly as much ire on the company themselves. I'm sure I'm the only one up here. But. Can, I, can I just say that I think that it's it's erroneous to make such a clear distinction between the two because we're talking about yeah it's you know, corporatism right. It's we're talking about a, a corporate control. I have the same uh, problems with with government. I don't think that they represent any of us. But I think that the if the if part of the problem is that. Uh, we can't actually. We don't actually have meaningful elections and things. You didn't elect Google to do anything. Furthermore, Google has a very serious, strong relationship with the U.S. State Department. No one ever talks about this. You know, Google CEO. I'm sorry, not the CEO. Google, the head of Google, Eric Schmidt, um, and the head of Google's think tank, which used to be called Google Ideas, which is now called Jigsaw, Jared Cohen. Uh, Jared Cohen is a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations is. Somebody just hiss. Nice. I was like, are you hissing at me? I don't know. Yes, hiss. No, exactly. I, I love that old, like, tr you know, um, movement thing. Um, yeah, Jared Cohen is a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Jared Cohen's specialization is counterterrorism. Um, he considers himself a kind of, like, rogue, weird mercenary. He's been to Afghanistan and Iran, and he has this whole sort of deep relationship with CIA client states and U.S. Um, military interests. And Google gets to go in and act as a proxy for the State Department all the time because they're Google. You know, the other thing is that they're steadily buying up military companies like Boston Dynamics, which is right near where I live, which is creating sort of soldier replacement um, they, were, they had the creepy robot yeah that seriously like a horse. so it's yeah. I mean to say that like one si like the corporate interests are working so closely with federal interests it's not like there's some like line in the sand where you can say like oh Google's gonna be fine I mean they're interested in power that's really what we're talking about yeah I find I'll admit I find it concerning that like Facebook you know works with the elections I mean like they they, they put huge banners up saying oh did, are you gonna vote today it's like no I'm not gonna vote I'm an anarchist what the hell are you talking about <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean and, it, it, and I can't help but like knee-jerk react to that as it being an arm of the state so I can be sympathetic to that I understand your points Jeremy and I appreciate I really appreciate you bringing them up um, but I think you know overall this gets to I want to get to the next question I want to make sure I'm sure there's plenty of questions out there who wants to ask questions already anybody oh man they're just ready to go all right so <laughs> Uh, and the next point is, is that really it seems to be it's important that people understand what exactly, how the internet works, how all this stuff works. Um, like we were talking about with Facebook and Google, 
I mean, yeah, their services are quote unquote free, but they're not really free. They're paid for by your data. You know, there, there, there is no, yeah, okay, that you don't have to exchange money necessarily, but they're not free. Um, and so, you know, with people to understand perhaps, how, you know, your outlook, how you're seeing what the internet is doing today, uh, if you could just spend a couple minutes, each of you, on what you think are important tools to look into. It could be a book, it could be, uh, a, you know, a piece of hardware, it could be anything. Just something actionable that people could take away and say, look, this is what you can do if you're concerned about this, or Jeremy, if, you know, if, if you want to recommend to people, open up those Facebook, uh, you know, make them public, make those accounts public, baby. Sorry, you know. <laughs> I said, I said I'm happy. Yeah. 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 We didn't I mean to turn this into an anti-Facebook uh, panel either, I but didn't. anyway. <laughs> so uh, Paige, we'll start with you and then we'll just go down the line. Sure, so get off Facebook. Um, <laughs> I'm totally serious, I like, I hate the fact that the Free State Project uses Facebook to organize things. It's really frustrating. The fact that you, that, sorry, not you guys, sorry, didn't, <laughs> almost made that mistake. Uh, the fact that the questions to Edward Snowden were organized on a Facebook thing. What? Come on, okay. <laughs> so pressure Free State Project to pick a different tool. I don't know if there's enough, like there are other like forum type softwares that we could use. In the meantime, of course, we're waiting for like that perfect replacement for Facebook as everyone is, but um, in the meantime, I don't know, just like try to migrate away from it at the very least. Uh, a tool that I do recommend that I, um, I can't speak more highly of is Signal. Um, it's very easy to use Android, um, uh, iOS, and they also have a, a Chrome extension that they're, they're testing right now, but it's essentially a replacement for text messaging. That's um, if the other person you're messaging has that app, it automatically encrypts everything. There's nothing you need to think about or do. Uh, just look for the little lock symbol, and then there's also the, the phone part of it where you can make encrypted phone calls, which sometimes it's a little rough on the around the edges when you're doing it, but it, it makes do. Um, so that's definitely the one tool I recommend. Spell that? Signal, S-I-G-N-A-L. Correct. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, yeah, great suggestions, Paige. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jeremy, go for yeah, it. Well, so first, just to just because I do want to set the record straight, I All am right. not some lover of Facebook and Google. <laughs> I'm I'm like the guy who I saw Zuckerberg I'm trying, bring in the check. When the <laughs> arguments, you know, too far to one side, I'm always the guy pushing it back. I'm like the guy who's like, a oh, Barry Bonds wasn't such a bad guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> so just to be clear, uh, I mean, they all do bad things. Yeah. Uh, uh, the number one, so in terms of that stuff, basically my point there was really, I mean, think about how much you care about these things. Uh, I mean, do expect that when you're posting something to Facebook or Google or your searches and these kinds of things, that these assume that these things are discoverable. I actually think in my head that I'm just like, if I'm posting this, I'm posting it to the public. And so, so that I have that way of thinking about it and I accept it. So you know, given, that's, that's given like those things. So that's one, just to mentally, just a accept that. Yeah. To go forward yeah, just have sure. that as yeah, a mindset. Um, in terms of specific tools, I think Signal is a great tool. In terms of a tool that um, probably the most realistic way that someone is going to get affected by their data being exposed is that their passwords are going to come out. If, you, if you're still using the same password on all kinds of systems, absolutely stop doing that. Um, I don't know uh, how people feel about LastPass now that they got acquired. I'm still using it. There are other password managers out there. If you're not using a password manager yet, that's one of the first things. That's, like, that's the most likely way, I think, that you're sure. going to have something bad happen to you on the internet. And so start using a password manager would be my biggest recommendation. Oh, and definitely install and run Tor. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I got to steal the easy answer. Yeah, no, it's, it's all good. We can, we can reiterate Allison, what go for it. saying, you know? Um, yeah, I want to just echo what Paige said about deleting your Facebook. Um, and it's not just that Facebook knows what you're, like, yeah, fine, yeah, everything you do on Facebook is public, but, like, Facebook is following you to every other site you go to as well. I mean, this is part of the problem is the whole sort of web of invisible tracking. Um, but, yes, definitely install and use Signal. Encourage all of your contacts to do the same. Um, even though the calling is a little bit wonky, I think the text interface is, like, perfectly good. It has... Uh, you can send images, you can send GIFs, you can send videos. It's got the full emoji keyboard, so like, you don't have to get rid of your emojis. I know how much they mean to you. Um, <laughs> and uh, definitely to echo what Jeremy said about using a password manager, um, one that is generally considered to be more secure than LastPass is 1Password. Um, it is not open source, um, but, the, but 
the security of it is pretty good, and it will you know you can sync it across devices. If you want an open source option, um, KeePass Key is pass. a great one. Yeah. And I recommend when you make your master password, use the Diceware method. You can just look it up and find it. It's really easy to make a memorable um, and truly random um, and high entropy master password. That's Diceware, D-I-C-E-W-A-R-E. Um, and then yeah, download and install Tor Browser. Um, and even if you don't really find that it meets your needs for web browsing, even if you just keep it open in the background, you are helping other people all over the world, especially in your geographic area who might really seriously need anonymity and privacy. So you're creating a kind of herd immunity. Um, I think for a group who have obviously like a, a collective mentality around the Free State Project, I think you can understand you know, what it means to like do things for other people in your community. So definitely Tor Browser. And then another really awesome new project is called Ricochet. Mm. Um, Ricochet is a chat client that uses Tor hidden services. So that is websites that only are accessible over Tor. Um, they never go out to the sort of public internet. They stay in the Tor cloud. Um, and what Ricochet is, is a metadata free peer-to-peer -peer chat client. So you can chat with other people with no information being leaked. There are no servers. And Ricochet has recently undergone, it's a new project, but they've recently undergone an audit um, and they've released a new version based on that audit. Um, it's a really awesome, great project that I recommend everyone check out. And it's on every operating, every desktop operating system. It's not for mobile. Fantastic. So uh, before we get to any closing comments, if anybody has one, then we can get to questions. I will just give my own little recommendation. Uh, this might be a little more advanced for some to use, but I am a huge proponent of Tails. It's an operating system. Uh, and it, you can install it on the smallest little USB device that you can find. And one thing that didn't get brought up a lot here, and that's okay, uh, was the importance of anonymity along with privacy. I think you can't, they, they're, they're kissing cousins, anonymity and privacy. And to have anonymity, if you install Tails, you could just slap it into your you know, USB drive on whatever laptop, whatever computer you're using, and then just pretend you're somebody else. Pretend, I don't, pretend you're the Green Ranger or Batman, I don't care. Okay, and, and then you know, go and do whatever browsing you like to do. It's a really simple, easy way to, uh, to do it. And they just updated recently to Tails 2.0. It's a fantastic little operating system. And then when you're all done, you can go back to being your normal self and pull out the USB drive and boot up your computer to hopefully something other than Windows. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but, uh, in any case, if anyone has any clo closing comments and then I want to get to questions, Paige, did you have a closing comment you'd like to make? You can go last. Allison, how about we start with you then? You, got a, you have a closing comment? I know, right on the spot. Can we get a spotlight, please? I don't know. Um, I mean, I kind of just want to hear from you guys. Are you all okay. uh, No, mo generally. I mean, the thing is, the problem is really, really huge. Um, we have so much work to undo. I, let me rephrase that. I am a little optimistic. One of the best things that's happened after Snowden is the massive, like, influx of activity and and like interest in free software um, where all the projects that I've been either working on or using for years have now, since Snowden, become so much more usable and so much more secure. We know so much more about the capabilities of these intelligence agencies now that we've been able to respond really directly to the threats. And so we've seen this unprecedented movement towards making even more stuff and solving all these problems. So I'm optimistic about that, although we still have a ways to go. Yeah, there's a real crypto economy that came out of that. It, that I agree. I'm excited about it, that as well. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm mildly optimistic. Yeah, I think that... Mildly? Uh, mild, mildly. It's You're not a mild It's not a given. Fellow, it's not think, a given. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, technology is getting better. It's get, We're doing more every day. And I actually, if you start, if I think about it as like a fundamental level, there's very, it's, it's really hard to stop these things, right? You can always build another layer on top. Unless the government is like directly controlling a very large number of servers and routes in the internet and actually blocking encrypted traffic, you, you know, there's very little that you can do to prevent. Like anonymous communication, I think, is actually fairly robust on the internet, I think it would be sure. very hard to shut that down. Um, sure. The one thing that you should do, of course, is donate to the Library Freedom Project. Hey, hey there we go. Uh, All right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and also install Library, which is LBRY. Right on. Yeah. And uh, keep your eye on Made Safe. But Paige, I mean, do you, are you optimistic about, you know, do you think we're going to have this privacy and anonymity in the future? Yeah, I think uh, I think there's things to be optimistic about. Um, I guess I wanted to mostly reiterate uh, 
my enthusiasm about mesh networking and finding alternatives to the ISP infrastructure that we have today because that's one of the kind of core central points that are um, not, they're one of the hardest problems that we're going to be solving because they have the actual infrastructure laid out and it's extremely difficult to lay new cable and deal with all these other things. So, I mean, there's technologies for, um, you know, using satellites um, and then there's, uh, I mean, there's this project called Caruso, which is kind of taking, uh, using lasers for uh, links between uh, mesh network type nodes instead of wireless. Um, so I, I guess just to uh, reiter reiterate that I would really like to see New Hampshire uh, build a mesh network and maybe I'll help, but if you do, <laughs> if you definitely start, I will definitely move here. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, if we could get a round of applause for all the panelists here. And then, do we have time for questions? We have three minutes. Okay, we don't, we don't have time for questions. Uh, so I will just say quickly that uh, I am also very optimistic uh, for the future. I think incredible things are happening, kind of to Paige's point. Uh, Think Penguin, the guys that do Think Penguin, if, if you don't know who they are, you need to look them up. They are moving to New Hampshire uh, for the Free Safe Project. And they have all the technology to make this mesh networking stuff happen, to make alternative internets. And I did say plural. I'm not from, never mind, I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> I did say plural. Uh, and, and it's just, it's very exciting what's happening here, especially in the, in the tech realm. And it's exciting what's happening all the way around. Thank you so much, uh, all panelists. Again, uh, you're doing great work, especially with education. That's fantastic, Allison. Thank you. And uh, library and made safe. And that's it. Again, thank you. <laughs>